Hi, and welcome to our presentation entitled Reopening the Michael Colombini MRI Case via Root Cause Analysis. This presentation was originally given at the RL Users Conference in Savannah, Georgia, June 7th through the 10th, 2011. Your presenters today will be myself, Robert J. Latino, and Mr. Toby Gilk. Toby is going to start us off today with a background on this case. Take it away, Toby. Thank you very much, Bob. What I'd like to talk with you about is the origins of contemporary MRI safety. The beginning of MRI safety, at least as it stands today, is with a CT scan, ironically enough. A CT scan of this boy, Michael Colombini, who took a fall on his school playground and was given a CT to check for skull fracture. The good news was that skull fracture CT was negative. The bad news was it showed a brain tumor. Now, almost immediately, the boy was admitted for neurosurgery, had the uh, surgery to remove the brain tumor, and as a follow-up to establish a baseline for his recovery and to check for recurrence, he was going to have an MRI scan. And unfortunately, any of you who know the name Michael Colombini know how that MRI scan turned out. I speak to a large number of professional groups in radiology. When I talk about this particular incident, I ask them the same question, what do you know about what caused this accident? And I usually get three or four answers. Um, somehow that there was an oxygen tank, that a nurse was involved, that as a result the boy died, and sometimes somebody knows the geography and knows that this particular accident occurred in New York. Well, if the object is to improve MRI safety, presumably MRIs are not inherently less safe in the state of New York, so that's not an effective causal route. Uh, the fact that the boy died, well, that's not cause, that's effect, uh, so that's not going to help us. Presumably the presence of a nurse in general is not terribly effective in terms of causation. So it, we're left with the fact that the oxygen tank caused this accident. And that's what the industry has largely run with. Now, for the first time, we are able to take a closer look at this particular accident because it was resolved about a year ago. Asked of the court documents were made publicly available through the Westchester County Clerk's Office. Court documents include first-person accounts from all of the key personnel as well as some documentation about the specific conditions of the accident. And by putting these pieces of the story together, we're actually able to recreate in detail that's never been available before what happened in this particular accident. Now, the accident occurred at Westchester Medical Center. And what you're looking at right now is a floor plan of the MRI facility. And to the left center, um, on this floor plan is the MRI scanner room. Immediately to the right of the scanner room is the control room where the technologist normally administers the exam. Below the MRI scanner room and the control room is a corridor that runs left to right on the plan and below that is an alcove, a preparation area directly opposite from the door to the MRI scanner room. These are some of the key areas that we're going to look at as the sequence of events unfolds. In addition to the areas, we need to know who the players are. The yellow square represents the anesthesiologist, who for the moment we're putting in the MRI scanner room. The blue star represents the boy, Michael Colombini, the patient um, in this particular accident. The purple rounded squares uh, represent the technologist. The one kind of lower down and to the left is the technologist at the console who was to run the exam. And the one above and to the right is the technologist who was working on post-processing for an earlier study from that day. So the boy is brought from the patient rooms um, down to the preparation area where the anesthesiologist sedates him initially. And he is then moved into the MRI scanner. The boy's still agitated. He gets another dose of sedative. Uh, the anesthesiologist sets him up with a uh, cannula to deliver supplemental oxygen and a pulse oximeter. Before the exam can commence, the anesthesiologist notes that the boy's pulse ox is dropping. So he goes to increase the flow rate of the oxygen going to the cannula. He goes to the wall outlet and he starts adjusting the valve on the regulator and notices that no oxygen is flowing from the regulator whatsoever. He's alarmed by this because the boy's pulse ox is dropping. So he goes, taps on the window to the control room, 
goes to the door after motioning to the tech to come and meet him. The tech comes around and asks, what can I do for you? The anesthesiologist is very upset that his patient's oxygen saturation levels are dropping and he needs oxygen for this boy. And in no uncertain terms, the anesthesiologist tells the tech, go fix it. The tech, who this tech was unfamiliar with the oxygen supply system, goes to the other tech and says, we need to fix this. The other tech says, well, if you don't know, this is the perfect opportunity for me to show you. Let's do it together. So the two of them enter the MRI equipment room, which with its fans and pumps and all of the stuff making noise, <clears throat> as soon as they step in, they are acoustically separated from everything else that occurs in the facility. They have no idea what's going on. They can't hear the anesthesiologist, our yellow square, hollering for them to get the oxygen turned on that his patient is crashing. He needs oxygen. Well, it just so happens that while the techs are in the equipment room and the anesthesiologist is yelling, a nurse who was returning to the MR department from a prior study, and she had left something in the area, she was coming back to retrieve it, she lets herself into the department and here's the anesthesiologist calling for supplemental oxygen. Like any professional compassionate nurse, she goes to see what she can do to help. She goes to the anesthesia prep bay and notices three portable oxygen cylinders. Well, Mr. Anesthesiologist, if you need oxygen, I have tanks right here. Here, have one. The anesthesiologist turns around, takes one step closer into the room, and the incredible attractive force of the magnetism from the MRI scanner pulls the tank out of his hand and it goes flying into the bore, the tunnel of the MRI scanner, where it strikes the boy, pummels him in his face and head. Remember, this boy just had surgery to remove a brain tumor. His skull was cracked a couple of days prior and he gets struck in the head repeatedly by this oxygen tank as it oscillates back and forth before coming to rest in the magnetic field. Well, the anesthesiologist and the nurse, they call the code team. While the code team is coming, the anesthesiologist pulls the boy out of the magnet. Um, they assess the extent of his injuries and it's clear immediately that it's more than they want to try and do uh, to stabilize him in the MRI department. They want to get him to the ED just as quick as possible. And while all of this is transpiring, the two technologists come out of the equipment room to say, we fixed the oxygen. And one of the first things they see is the anesthesiologist covered in the boy's blood from removing him from the MRI. The efforts of the tech turned out to be too little, too late. Well, this is the sequence of events that occurred on that day. However, what we're really interested in is what laid the foundation for this to be able to occur. What are the decisions and the conditions that were set weeks, months in advance of this particular accident that created an environment in which it was allowed to occur? So we've moved from oxygen tank, nurse, the boy died, state of New York, to a much more comprehensive knowledge of the events of that day. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Bob and we are going to drill down and we're going to go from the specific events of that day to the root cause, the conditions that allowed this event to occur. Bob? Okay, let's look at the uh, elements of this particular case and look at the symptomatic focus versus the systems focus. Symptoms are the results of decisions. So as a result of our decision, it's a consequence of that decision. Systems, on the other hand, influence our decisions. So when we're looking at you know, why we make the decisions we do at the time that we do, they're usually going to be influenced by systems such as our training, our uh, experience, our uh, policies, our procedures, things of that nature. Those are systems that affect our decision making. As a result of our decision making, we trigger symptoms to occur. Focusing on the magnetic nature of a fire extinguisher in the MRI only, as opposed to observing other ferrous medical gas tanks that may be, uh, be present, is an example of focusing on the symptoms instead of the systems. Okay, let's look at the Columbini case background 
and just make a few notes. In litigation, it is often difficult, if not impossible, to learn about how accidents occurred because of the confidentialities and sealed court documents. However, in the Columbini civil case, that is not the case. Uh, this, there was a settlement reached in 2009, and while the parties cannot comment on the case, it was agreed that the court records not be sealed. In 2010, the last of the civil documents filed with the Westchester County Clerk's Office became available. While not all civil litiga litigation evidence was filed with the court, sufficient first-person depositions, reports, and accounts of the events of that day and those leading up to it are in the record to paint a reasonably complete picture. Let's look at the basic relationships in this unfortunate case. The Westchester Medical Center owned a purpose-built MRI suite addition to the hospital and the single MRI scanner within it. The hospital subcontracted the management and operation of the MRI service to University Medical Imaging Associates. Uh, UMIA employed the MRI clinical and technical staff. UMIA's president was also the chair of the radiology for Westchester Medical Center. Okay, let's review the basics of the germination of a failure. We talked about uh, systems earlier, and in this particular case, the, the listing you see below are going to be such systems. When we have deficient systems, what that does is force bad information to our decision makers. As we make decisions with good intent, based on bad information, this triggers us to uh, trigger a series of cause and effect relationships. As these progress, eventually we're going to have to address them because they're going to result in an undesirable outcome. So for terminology's sake, we're going to call the systemic issues latent root causes because they're always there, but they're just paper. They're not activated until there's a human decision involved. The human root cause is going to be a decision itself. And then as a result of that decision, that inappropriate decision, it's going to trigger a series of physical consequences, and we'll call those physical root causes. Okay, let's reverse that now and say that this undesirable outcome has occurred, and now we have to go ahead and analyze it, and we're going to reverse our course. We're going to start with the event or the facts of the incident, and we're going to work backwards in time, moving back frame by frame. So the green box here is our event, or our least acceptable consequence of an undesirable outcome. Our blue blocks become our modes. These are the reasons that the event occurred, but they are factual. Everything in the top two levels is going to be factual. Now, we don't know why these blue blocks occurred, and we start to become hypothetical, asking how could, as opposed to why at this stage. We're going to let the evidence that we collect tell us what's true and what's not and we're only going to proceed down the things that prove to be true. Uh, this is the way it will occur. Physical roots, human roots, latent roots. Only after we identify the poor decision making or the human roots will we switch our questioning to why. Because now we're between the ears of the decision maker and we want to understand why they thought it was the right decision at the time that they made it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the root cause analysis in this case. Okay, off to the left we have a legend about particular symbols so that they'll make more sense as we go through this logic tree. Our event in this case is a fatal head trauma injury to a sedated six-year-old undergoing an MRI. The reason this occurred at a very high level was that ferrous oxygen canisters were drawn into the MRI tunnel. Our question becomes, how could that happen? Our possibilities are that the canisters were left in the MRI room prior to the scan, or they were introduced during the scan. Notice that you have numbers in the lower left-hand corner. These are confidence factors. A zero means with the evidence we have, this is not true. A five, conversely, means with the evidence we have, this is absolutely true. And if we double-click on any of these hypotheses, we'll see what we call a verification log. In this particular case, the verification method was a review of the New York State Department of Health Article 28 Statement of Deficiencies and Plan of Corrective Actions from 73101, page 10 of 10. The outcome is that the review concludes that canisters were introduced into the MRI room during the scan. This is without a doubt true. 
and we also can file link that particular uh, evidence into this record. So I just wanted to go through that one so that you know everything is supported as we go down through this logic. How could canisters have been introduced into the MRI room during the scan? They were introduced by the MRI techs, by housekeeping, by anesthesiologist and the nurse, or by some vendor supply personnel. In this particular case, it was proven that it was brought in, the canisters were brought into the MRI room by the anesthesiologist slash nurse, as opposed to the others. But this shows that we checked. So now we go in and we say, well, how could they have been introduced by these people? The piped-in oxygen supply was depleted at the commencement of the scan. How can that happen? There was no mechanism in place to identify when the oxygen supply was low or empty. How could that be? The staff had no guidelines to follow. Now notice we're at a human route, so we're going to say, well, why didn't they? The policy related to the oxygen equipment was not written. Previous incident reports were not properly acted on. Why? There's a conflict in roles between the responsibilities of the contractor and the hospital for both of these. So now we look at the latent roots or the systemic issues that contributed to the decision and then that prompted the physical consequences. The backed up piped in oxygen supply was not readily available. How can that be? The second piped in oxygen tank was not in place prior to the commencement of the scan. The staff had no guidelines to follow. The policy related to the uh, oxygen supply was not written and there was a failure to disclose, analyze, and respond to prior incidents. Again, we're getting into the systemic issue of there was a conflict in roles and responsibilities between the contractor and the hospital. And that's what forces these decisions about uh, having no guidelines is that they weren't deemed necessary not tied into the hospital central system alerting uh, engineering of any anomaly. How can that be? Violation of state code. All right, we're continuing on about how these canisters could have been introduced to the MRI room. The MRI uh, was unsafe oxygen canisters were readily accessible. Canisters available in the MRI suite outside of the MRI scanning room. How could that be? Poor human factors design, it was a setup factor for a high risk event. Putting the canisters or allowing them to be out there increased the risk that they would be brought into the MRI suite just because of their proximity and availability. The procedure does not exist to prevent placing unsafe canisters in the MRI suite. How can that be? Conflict in roles and responsibilities between the contractor and the hospital. You start to see a common theme here from a system standpoint. The technologist was unaware of the MR safe canister option. How can that be? There was no institutional requirements for MRI training and there's no regulatory requirements for MRI training. How could the control desk have been unsupervised? The MRI techs were unavailable. How could the MRI techs be unavailable? Both techs were working on the piped-in oxygen problem in the adjacent room. Why? The anesthesiologist was insistent to the techs about getting back up. Why? It was unclear about the roles and responsibilities and reporting structure, and the tech administering the exam was unfamiliar with the oxygen setup. Why? Because there was no institutional requirements for MRI training. Again, the conflict in roles and responsibilities between the contractor and the hospital, inadequate training on how to have situational control of the suite. Again, no institutional requirements and no regulatory requirements. Patient not removed from the MR room to receive supplemental oxygen. How can that be? The inadequate clinician training on risks in the MRI. Why? The anesthesiologist did not have any experience with the MR at this hospital. No institutional requirements for MRI training and no regulatory requirements. An inadequate policy existed requiring the clinician to do so. Where MRI, where MR policies did exist, they were not effectively conveyed. The clinician was not adequately trained in this MR uh, in equipment. Well, how can that be? No institutional requirements, no regulatory requirements. So you can see there's a lot of loopholes here allowing this particular event to have occurred. Inadequate physical security of the MRI suite. How can that be? Inadequate signage related to MRI safety. How can that be? Safety zone around the scanner was not clearly marked. Why? 
lack of regulatory requirement on effective controls. There was also unauthorized personnel entering the MRI suite. How can that happen? The nurse admits herself to the MRI suite when she was not qualified. Why? Because there was no effective access controls on the MRI suite entrance. Why? There's a lack of human factors consideration in developing such controls, lack of regulatory requirement on such effective controls, a security breach due to familiarity with staff, and no effective physical barrier to prevent unauthorized access. Inadequate training for non-MRI personnel. How can that occur? Conflict in roles and responsibilities between the contractor and the hospital. Lack of adequate oversight for MRI safety. No MRI safety training materials on site. No institutional and no regulatory requirements for such training. So now we can see the systemic issues that we talked about that led to the symptoms that led to this unfortunate incident. Now let's return back to our presentation. Thank you, Bob. Ed. At this point, it's probably appropriate for us to take a quick little retrospective looking back on this incident, not so much as sort of a spectacle, um, you know, that, but really to try and take a look at what this incident can teach us about accident prevention and, and MRI safety. As with so many accidents, there is no single egregious error uh, that was the direct precipitating cause of this. It actually turned out to be a sequence of contributory elements, including absence of effective policies, procedures, staff training, absence of access controls, or effective facility design to promote safety best practices, and in this case, a failure to respond to near-miss opportunities to identify and correct patient safety lapses in the MRI environment. A lot of times when I talk on this particular accident, I get the, well, Toby, that was 10 years ago. Surely we've internalized the information about this accident and we've put in place preventative steps, although no one can really put their finger on precisely what those preventative steps are. And in fact, going back to what we said earlier about what professionals typically respond in terms of what they know about this accident, you know, New York nurse, oxygen cylinder, and the fact that the boy died, there doesn't appear to be any demonstrable knowledge that has worked its way into the industry as a result of this. And in fact, recent data bears out the fact that we haven't internalized this at all. In fact, MRI accidents are on an alarming increase. With this data, from 2004 to 2008, there was more than a tripling of MRI accidents reported to the FDA. And if we extended the data by one more year, from 2004 to 2009, it's almost five-fold. So clearly, the message has not gotten through. And if we think that the problems historically in the recent past are significant, they don't hold a candle to what we're in store for if we don't take corrective action. Specifically, what we're talking about is a little bit of crystal ball gazing but none of these are what-ifs. They're all currently happening. Uh, they're just what effect are they going to have? And they include population demographics, emergent trauma imaging, image-guided, interventional, and intraoperative MRI, stronger MRI systems, and reimbursement reductions. Population demographics, the baby boomers are crossing the 65-year-old threshold. And at 65, the rate of MRI utilization grows two and a half to three times. Emergent trauma imaging, more risk factors. Same with image-guided, interventional, and intraoperative. And as the population, demographic, and clinical factors are changing, so too are the technical elements. MRI systems are growing in strength. And simultaneous with all of these, we are actually cutting reimbursement rates. That means fewer staff or staff of less qualifications supervising the safety of the MRI environment. It's critical that we take a look at this accident, not simply in terms of some sort of comfort in understanding this particular incident and what happened, but more importantly, to take a look at what the causative elements were and how we might be able to implement effective safety remediation to reverse not only the recent past in terms of growth, but address these coming issues that are going to make MR produce greater number, greater severity of injuries if we don't take appropriate steps. Bob, back to you. Okay, thank you for those uh, summary of conclusions, Toby. 
this brings our presentation to an end. Uh, please look for this review and analysis in the 2011 fall issue of Patient Safety and Quality Healthcare magazine. We thank you for your time and your consideration, and we wish you the best in your patient safety efforts.